Excellent. So we've got some new modules. Uh, if you like milk with your bowl of cereal, you'll love unauthenticated remote code execution with your deserialization volumes. And we've got two modules this time around. Our own Shelby Pace added a new module targeting vulnerable versions of Oracle's WebLogic server software, achieving unauthenticated remote code execution on vulnerable targets by sending a crafted serialized bad attribute value EXP exception object over the T3 protocol. Pretty cool. We will have a demo of this, so stick around. And our own Will Vu added a new exploit module targeting vulnerable versions of My Little Admin, a management tool for Microsoft SQL Server that can be found as a standalone application and also found integrated into other products such as Parallels Plesk. The vulnerability exploited by this new module is related to static default keys being used to protect the integrity of the view state value, allowing this module to leverage the situation to submit a malicious view state that will be deserialized as .NET and execute a command within the context of the web server. No authentication required. And Community Contributor Hoodie came through with two new modules targeting Synology NAS devices running vulnerable versions of their disk station manager software. The first module allows enumeration of users on a device running the vulnerable software, taking advantage of, of, a differing, of differing responses when performing a GET to the forgot password URL endpoint uh, and allowing the module to identify which users exist on the target. The second module achieves, un achieves authenticated remote command execution on the target running vulnerable software via the smart CGI endpoint, and we will have a demo of this. And on top of those Synology modules, Hoodie also came through with three modules targeting PyHole a Linux-based advertisement and internet tracker blocking application, which achieve code, uh, sorry, achieve command and code execution on vulnerable versions. The first module adds a new block list to the target and then forces an update, following that with a write of PHP payload content to a file within WebRoot and then launching that code as the root user. Pretty nice. We'll have a demo of that. The second module exploits a vulnerability where requesting addition to the whitelist of a crafted domain value, one which has a command appended to it, will have that command automatically executed, including commands which download and execute a payload, which this module does. And the third module exploits a vulnerability where adding a new static list DHCP entry with a MAC value that contains a shellcode payload will be executed by vulnerable targets. And interestingly enough, the DHCP server does not need to be running on the target for this to work. And we will have a demo of this. And rounding out our module list today, community contributor Shooting RZ added a not denial of service module targeting bind DNS services with known TSIG key values. For bind releases from March 2018 and later, this module will crash the service. For releases prior to March 2018, the service, the module will leave the service in a state that is running, but it will be an inconsistent state, which is not safe. So nice addition of modules this time around. And as always, there's a lot of other valuable work going on to talk about outside of the module space. Community contributor C. Noten added and updated the action description of a large number of auxiliary and post modules, smoothing out the user experience when listing or choosing available module actions. I appreciate that. Contributor Tim Wright added a new stager format to allow a Python stager to call back and receive a binary interpreter payload, similar, similar to the PSH reflection format. That's a nice addition there as well. And we will have a, a demo of this. Community contributor Kabbalah Security made a nice update to the Eyes of Network auto discovery exploit module, adding support for deploying interpreter sessions using a command stager, as well as an authentication bypass for versions 5.1 and 5.2. It's up there. Community contributor S. Brun updated some syntax in the SMB MPacket WMI exec Python module to be Python 3 compatible. And our own Adam Kamek updated search after use behavior to not list external modules that aren't loadable by the system, which should make the end user experience smoother by not showing modules which can't successfully load. Contributor B. Coles cleaned up the tiny ident D stack buffer overflow module. I appreciate that. And B. Coles and Hoodie both added the missing module docs too. Huzzah. Huzzah for module docs. And bug fixes. We have a few bug fixes. 
a uh, couple in them with Meterpreter. The contributor OJ squashed a challenging bug originally reported a few years ago by user Arisada, which where certain conditions could cause Meterpreter's packet dispatcher code to process packets out of order, which could cause protocol negotiation sequences to fail. So great fix there. Thank you, OJ. And another Meterpreter fix, contributor Tim Wright fixed the Java Meterpreter to correctly handle standard error text stream. Uh, visible, for example, when the Meterpreter shell command and encounter, when using the Meterpreter shell command and encountering standard error output there. Tim also added a test for this too, which is great. So I appreciate that. Community contributor C. Noten fixed a regression of the service file name and service stub encoder options in TS exec code, ensuring both options are not ignored. That's good. And our own Adam Kamek updated framework's default behavior of payload encoding logic to no longer encode payloads if those payloads do not contain any bad chars. Efficiency for the win. And our own Alan Foster made a quick fix to plug a memory leak in MS01026 double decode module. Good stuff there. And our own Will Vu added some minor output and command stage or flavor fixes to the Think PHP and Manage Engine Exploit modules, respectively. And those be the bug fixes. Uh, and we have a bonus slide. Uh, I'd like to, to mention again, we've, we talked about it a couple of meetings ago, that Metasploit is participating in the Google Summer of Code this year, thanks to efforts by Spencer McIntyre and Jeffrey Martin. Uh, Spencer, would you like to share a few details about how that's going? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yesterday marked the first day of the coding portion of the project. Prior to that, uh, Jeffrey and I had been talking to our mentees and getting them onboarded with the community bonding period of the Google Summer of Code. And uh, they are going to be working on uh, two separate projects. Uh, my mentee will be working on some session style module interaction and some improvements into how module options are exposed through the Metasploit UI that I think users will uh, really like. And Jeffrey's mentee is working on a SQL I uh, library, a SQL injection type library, uh, which is uh, going to be particularly interesting. You know, just over the last month, I've noticed uh, two exploit modules leveraging SQL injection. So it definitely seems like something that's trending a little bit right now, the most recent of which uh, was the relatively high profile V Bulletin uh, module. So I think we're going to get a lot of use out of that, and I am pretty excited for it. The last thing I wanted to mention is that we are going to be hoping to do some uh, demos of our progress uh, in future uh, Metasploit demos. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Spencer. Yeah, that'd be fantastic to, to have some content to, to show off during these demo meetings. Um, really excited that we're participating. Appreciate the update there, sir. Uh, and as always, for details on recent framework activity, you can check out the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blog post at blog.rabbit7.com. And we do appreciate everybody who helps make Metasploit better through their contributions to the project. Thank you. And time for demos. Everybody loves demos. Uh, how about a demo of the WebLogic server deserialization RCE with Shelby? Shelby, you on yep. the line? Yep, cool. I am. All right, let me do the thing. Okay. Okay, so uh, yeah, so this is a module that exploits uh, three versions of WebLogic uh, for both Linux and Windows platforms. Um, so basically uh, what it does is it builds a bad attribute value exp exception object um, and sends that over, serializes it uh, and sends it over uh, the T3 protocol, which is this proprietary protocol that WebLogic uses to communicate. Um, basically once you send that over, it manages to reach a code path that uh, results in a call to method.invoke, uh, which allows you to uh, execute code. And so you should see that soon and interpreter session. And yeah. Oh, that looks pretty easy to use. Yep. <laughs> well, that's not a question, but yeah, observation. Cool. Thank you, Shelby. Great. No really nice. That that was one of the recent ones, right, Shelby? One of the recent uh, uh, yep. critical vulns. Yeah, nice. I know there are a lot for, for web logic, so it's it's nice when we can yeah, quite um, a few. More. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Cool. Thanks, Shelby. Uh, let's move on. Steve, so Alan Foster, are we going to show us some some piehole block list RCE goodness? Does that sound accurate, yeah. Alan? Okay, cool. Yeah. I'll start the thing here. All right. 
Cool. Uh, so as discussed before, PyHole is a DNS filtering tool to block ads, malware, malicious sites, etc. It's got an, ad, an admin panel that you can log into. Uh, this particular exploit requires Metasploit to run its HTTP server on port 80. Um, so you may need to run that uh, pseudo. Um, it requires the password to the PyHole console, um, but it does give root shell and it achieves this via command injection when adding a blacklist block list uh, to PyHole itself. Uh, and this was contributed by Hootie and the little research was done by Nick. Um, so you can see a shell in the background. Nice. But wait, there's more. Uh, we've also got a, a DHCP lease command execution demo here. So yep, pretty much the same as the, the previous module. Um, this one is command injection when configuring a new DHCP lease um, by specifying a MAC address, which also uh, includes uh, RCE. Um, this does not require running on port 80, but it still requires the password to the admin console. Uh, and again, gives root shell and was contributed by Hootie. Nice. And I, I think the, uh, the write-ups for the, the module docs include setup, pretty good setup information around if you wanted to test, you know, have a setup as a vulnerable target to test these on. Nice. Are, are, uh, I had a quick question. Are the PyHole vulnerabilities only exploitable from within the target network or do you, can you be like, can like a malicious third party um, perhaps execute them as well, like from the outside? If you have the admin password and that UI is exposed to um, the world, then yes. Okay. Thanks, Alan. And uh, we have a demo of a privilege, privilege escalation via Druva InSync. This module was authored by community contributor Beacoles, and we actually talked about it in the last demo meeting, but we're just circling back here with a demo of it with our own Brendan Waters. Brendan, you ready for me to hit the button? Absolutely. Uh, cool. This particular product uh, has an interesting uh, feature in it that there is a port listening on loopback that accepts uh, basically an instruction that says run this exe and it does so as system. So this privilege escalation just uh, sends that message to the loopback address on the machine and uh, it runs it as system. Here you go. I have a session on the system, uh, get system does not work. So I'm not a privileged user at this point. Go ahead, use the uh, exploit. It's relatively straightforward. All you provide is the session that you want to use and the payload that you want it to run. In this particular case, it'll call back to us. And fire this off and it requests that the server uh, run the exe that we gave it that that's a payload and it sends us back a session uh, it failed to delete the file because that file is the exe we're currently running as so that requires some manual cleanup later but as you can see we're uh system nice uh, we'll hang out with Brendan for another demo here on the, the Python to binary interpreter, uh, new payload -y goodness. All right, hit the button. So this is uh, a, a fun little uh, contri uh, contrib contribution by uh, Tim Wright. Uh, this is a payload that allows a Python callback that sends a binary uh, payload. So this is, you know, uh, we have a, a few other instances where we do this, but it's nice because if you have a Python foothold, which is not uncommon, you can go ahead and leverage that automatically to a binary interpreter session. So in this case, I just built the payload uh, using the uh, remote handler uh, for, to make this work uh, for the format. Uh, it's reflective, Python reflection, I believe, is the TAC F. Uh, in this case, I'm using this on an OS X machine. And it's just a standard setup for the uh, exploit multi-handler. We don't have to do anything special on the handler side. 
we've started our TCP handler. I launched the uh, Python script on the remote machine. It sends in the request. We've opened up the session. In just a moment, we should get a prompt back. We built this in for suspense. There we go. Uh, and here I'm going to interpret a prompt. Sysinfo, we're in fact running uh, on OS X. The fun thing that I noticed is our PID 1784 is Python. So we're running a binary session in uh, the Python process. That's cool stuff. And I think we're going to round out our Metasploit demos here with uh, one more uh, of one of the Synology modules. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, Synology are uh, basically NAS uh, disk stations, uh, you typically used for, you know, sort of home. Um, in this case, there is an authenticated exploit that allows us to send in, I believe it's a scan request, and inside the name of the disk that we wanted to scan, you can embed a command. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, I did want to point out that the check on this can be a little bit frustrating. Um, so in this case, it doesn't actually say that it says it can't check it because the page with the version has changed and we weren't able to locate the new location. But in this case, it runs just fine. I have a um, interpreter session on a power PC because, you know, a blast from the past is useful. And you can see that we are root. Uh, also in this same vein, there's a new module to enumerate the users. Uh, but I decided nobody wanted to actually watch as we brute force users every 35 seconds. So there's no demo for that. <laughs> but it is available in framework. You can play with that module. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's move on to Attacker KB or the Attacker Knowledge Base. Uh, this is uh, available at attackerkb.com. Uh, come visit it, learn about what people are thinking about new uh, and old uh, volumes alike. Um, we're pushing updates out to it regularly. Uh, today we've got demos of a, a few things that are, have, are kind of recent to Attacker KB work. Uh, I think Matthew's going to be showing us a couple of different things, uh, including a leaderboard view. Matthew, you want, should I stop my share? Yeah, that's fine. All right, so the leaderboard everyone's familiar with, it was uh, displaying 10 users by default, and some of those 10 users are sort of dominating the upper ranks of that board. So we decided uh, that maybe we want to open up and let people see a little bit more, uh, a greater view in there. So we added this uh, little view drop down here. You can come through and say, show you the top 50 now. Uh, it used to display top 10 by default, and there was no view option. The view option now gives you the ability to toggle and see 50 users. So you get a little more insight into what's going on below those top 10 and uh, maybe get a little more excited about what's going on uh, between different users and their assessments uh, and scores and all that. And you can continue to dig down into each user's profile to find out a little bit more about what they've been posting in your favorite top 10 or top 50 users. Nice. And we have some additional assessment count badges. Yeah, so currently uh, the system has the top, uh, the badges you see at the top there, which are the user's profile will have a badge next to it. Uh, associated with their assessment count. So when the user gets 10 assessments, they'll get the 10, uh, 50 or 100 badge. We wanted to provide a little more uh, granularity there. So there's some additional badges that will be coming. This is not currently live, but it will be in our next deployment. So now when 
you'll be able to see users who have uh, at least 5, 20, or 30, or 40 in addition to those original uh, 10, 50, and 100 badges. So uh, get a little more, you know, badge flair, if you will, for your uh, providing your assessments. Uh, just nice. wanted to Where they show up. Yeah, uh, they show up on a profile, but they also show up next to the user's name in their assessments, for example. Awesome. So we just wanted to celebrate our users' uh, success as they continue to provide uh, helpful assessments. And that's what these will hopefully do. So coming, the, the uh, 5, 20, 30, and 40 badges will be coming at our next deployment. Nice. Thank you, Matthew. Mm -hmm. Excellent.